so here's the thing like part part of muscle damage um, that you create with when you train is simply mechanical disruption of the contractile elements okay. that's that's the initial injury so then the inflammatory process is to go in there and clean those things out there's some autophagy that's involved there you're cleaning out um, and reusing protein amino acids to some degree to rebuild and then if you're if you're progressively overloading with resistance training, the idea is that you come back stronger. But yeah. if you have an extreme injury or maybe you're extraordinarily sore and not recovering um, and you're taking anti-inflammatories, this is what the single study with N acetylcysteine showed, they didn't, have re they didn't fully recover. The performance never came back like nine days later. And that's because they blunted that cleanup and recovery process because hmm. they blunted the inflammatory process. So the inflammation is normal. It's, it's what you want. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. All of our programming is brought to you by truenutrition.com. You can use our code THINK, um, at least at the airing of this show. I saw that Carbo Load, one of their complex carbohydrates, was on sale for like $17.99 a pound. If you use a hat, that's like, I think, 50 grams of carbs per serving. So that is a ton of carbs for a really good price. If you need a deal or you just want good quality supplements, check them out. Also, check out Strom Sports Nutrition if you're in the UK. Um, if you are in Canada, well, I'm sorry, they, they just put a freeze on all handgun transfers, but you can still go to uh, supplementsource.ca. They've got a lot of crazy deals. They change week to week. Of course, we're brought to you by everybody at Patreon. Thank you guys very much, everybody who's helping to support the show. And we're brought to you by Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach. Scott's book, mm -hmm. you can go to byobbcoach.com or you can go and get the hardcover off of Amazon. I'll have links to all this stuff below. All that stuff helps to support our programming. Scott, we've got a fun one today. Uh, we were asked about NSAIDs in bodybuilding. Uh, do they do they destroy your gains? Do NSAIDs stop your gains? I'm excited to hear about this because... Um, I remember back like 2006, uh, somebody in, it was like on MD, uh, a pro bodybuilder, I think it was Victor Martinez, was talking about how like, you never want to take NSAIDs in one of his in his interviews. He was saying mm. that like an NSAID will basically end all your gains. Um, mm. And I've since heard that. We've talked about this a couple of times, but we never made it like an actual topic. We've referenced it tons of times through our recordings. So I guess I'll just bring that question up. Um, if I can find it here, this is from Neven. And he had said, um, I know it's not good to take anti-inflammatory pain medications too often as it blunts the inflammatory process and inhibits gains. But sometimes the pain is just too much, whether it's tendinitis or general muscle soreness. If I had to take one, which of the top NSAIDs would uh, you say is the least negative impact on your health between aspirin, ibuprofen, napro naproxen, he says, or uh, acetaminophen? Love the show. All right. So the first like global response I had to that, besides before we get into the NSAIDs and differentiation and some of the science stuff is if the pain is that great, then <laughs> you need to slow down and do something else. Like stop. If the, if the muscle soreness is so extreme, yeah. that you need to take NSAIDs or a pain reliever, then you've, you're training too much or you're training too frequently or something about your training stimulus is excessive. Yeah. Shouldn't be that much. And I, and I know from experience, <laughs> I did that for years. You can make progress while you're still sore, but um, that, is, that is not the best way to go. So you're, you need to, something needs to come back down. Um, and if it's tendonitis, well, then you're, then you're heading towards an injury. I mean, you, the classic story people talk about is is uh, Doreen Yates with his I think it was biceps tears maybe triceps tear. It's one point for one of those preps when he had one of those tears going into the show he, he just kept on pushing through it. He didn't step take a step back and I don't I can't exactly quote him but basically his thought was that he tried to do too much he kept going he could have maybe taken a week off of direct training of that triceps or biceps whatever it may have been and recovered from that tendonitis but then he had the tear. Yeah. So that was the tendonitis that became a tendinosis, which then led to a tear. So you're you're just you're just asking for it <laughs> when you've got tendonitis that you're masking the pain with. Um, so I actually mentioned this in the context of using Quan Long oil, which is a topical liniment that a lot of people use. I sort of I mentioned it long ago in one of Dave Henry's videos. 
um, when I was in acupuncture school, I looked for topicals to sort of help get past those those acute inflammation periods in like a knee tendonitis, patellar tendonitis, or elbow issues, golfers, elbow, tennis elbow. Um, but the problem with these, with the, there's various problems. The problem, for instance, with the tendon, um, and I mentioned this in my book, is that if you inhibit the inflammatory process, you're also going to blunt protein synthesis. Mm. And especially in as far as collagen goes and connective tissue goes, um, relative to muscle tissue, the, the protein synthesis effect you get from a training load, which would lead to remodeling and strengthening and make sure that tendon can handle the loads that you're exposing the muscle to as you train and get stronger and progress, um, that immediate acute response is even less. So the tendons can lag behind. This is probably connected to why you see guys who, when they get on gear and they get really strong and really big, Yes, um, they're getting, potentially there's some issues just with the way the gear turns on protein synthesis in the tendons. So maybe you're getting more fragile or, or brittle tendons, but you're also basically growing to the extent, to greater extent in the muscles. So you end up having a weak link in form of the tendons. If you're applying stuff or using anti-inflammatories or a topical that's a local anti-inflammatory, you're going to slow down the recovery, the protein synthesis, the repair that needs to happen when that muscle or that tendon excuse me, remodels itself. So you're, you're basically potentially increasing your likelihood for a tear um, for the reason that the tendon isn't going to be able to adapt because you're blunting that stimulus for adaptation and you're masking the pain that in my opinion, you should be absolutely paying attention to. So the basic rule of thumb that I've always had, if you want to train through an injury, which, which can be done, if you've got a bad injury, then, you know, go see somebody, something that's gone on for, you know, a couple of weeks without a doubt, find a professional, just don't do the stuff that makes it hurt. Yeah. Right. So you can, I mean, you can train chest with isolation movements. You can train deltoids with isolation movements. You can do overhead flies um, you can do overhead cable movements for delts instead of an overhead press. You can get all sorts of side and rear laterals, pec flies. There's a million ways you can do those and, and have no pain in, a, let's say, a tricep tendonitis. And then you just don't train your triceps for until, they're, until they get better and treat them in whatever way you need to. But training through especially tendonitis or extreme muscle soreness is, is, um, is just asking for an injury. Yeah. So that's kind of like the basic thought. If you use NSAIDs, um, the issue there is that you are you're diminishing part of the inflam diminishing the inflammatory response, which is part of the stimulus for growth. The same thing happens actually when people uh, take excessive amounts of antioxidants. Like a standard dose has been tested now several times is a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, four hundred milligrams sort four hundred IU's of vitamin E. There are two studies now, one with young women and one with older men showing blunted muscle growth when people took, um, in, in, the, in the men's study, they took 500 milligrams of vitamin C and 200 IUs of vitamin E before and after. So they did a like peri-workout antioxidant regime. And that's a thousand milligrams of vitamin C is the equivalent of like 30 oranges or something like that. Okay. It's massive. You would never get that from normal food. So you're blunting that free that uh, reactive oxygen species and free radical stimulus. That's part of what turns on the adaptive process. Hmm. The whole point of training is to send a stress signal, right? So you blunt that with anti with with antioxidants in, in mega doses like that, or you can blunt that with anti-inflammatories. And what you see then is that you do diminish the protein synthetic effect. You diminish the recruitment of satellite cells. So the whole process with satellite cells, which is very important for muscle growth, gets reduced. Basically, you're just you're shooting yourself in the foot um, when you when you do that because you're you're diminishing what you've just done in the gym. And you mentioned when we were kind of chatting about this, um, and we came up with or this topic was was sent in. There is a study with older folks. Out of out of Ball State, that one of the Trappy brothers there did this study. They do very cool stuff, where they they use both ibuprofen and acetaminophen, and they found in older individuals that they had greater muscle growth, like eight percent versus twelve percent or something like that in a quad. Yeah, quad. So, the, in the grand scheme of things, you evoke a stimulus, 
that creates an adaptive process. A little bit, you get a little bit of adaptation. A little more of a stimulus, you go from three sets to six sets, let's say, when whatever your frequency training is, you got a little bit ad- more adaptation. Maybe your sweet spot's nine sets a week, okay. right? Whoever way you train. Then that's your optimal adaptation because your recovery matches and you've stimulated maximal rates of progression in terms of muscle growth. You go to 12 sets or 15 sets, and now we're talking about junk volume. Now we're talking about a situation that Nevin or might be in where you've got extreme muscle soreness that he's noticing when he is coming back into the gym to train a muscle group again. Yes. So now you've got a situation where um, he's doing too much and his recovery abilities aren't bringing him back to a cover place where he's actually had an adaptation from workout one to the next workout, workout two, let's call it. Yeah. Because he's done too much. That's excessive. Now, he could keep on training. This is this is the kind of the problem is that space between optimal for adaptation between workouts where you're where you've sort of tuned in and you've refined your your stimulus to get the best rate of adaptation and what you can actually recover from. So like I, I think Mike Isratel, I may have this wrong, but he might call that maximal recoverable volume. Okay. Maximal recoverable volume. For instance, I like that term. That, that could be gigantic. Like you could go in there and if you know if you're just a tough SOB, you'll just keep on pummeling yourself and you can you can train with twice two and a half times the volume that would be optimal for you for making yeah. progress um, and still come back and do it. I, I did that when I, when I trained with Derek Oslin hmm. years ago, a year ago, last year, I guess it was maybe. Yeah. The beginning of last year, so a year and a half ago, we we're doing John Meadows training. We we're doing it a volume that was, that suit was suited for him. I looked at it on paper. I'm like, there's well, the way I train and the way we're going to train. There's just no way I'm going to be able to recover from this, at least optimally. I still made progress. Um, because I ate my ass off. That's when the serial gains. I, I employed every trick in the book, basically, so that I could hang <laughs> with him. Yeah. Um, just make it through. But I knew it wasn't optimal because I was sore every time I came in there. I had warm up extra, like old man itis in full effect, right? Yeah. I knew it, but I was just having fun because I wanted to be able to train like that. It was a blast. I love to train, right? Right. So, so you've got this situation now where, in Nevin's case, I think he's probably doing too much. Um, He's taking the he's taking the painkillers. He may be taking them, you know. Maybe there's just certain muscle growths, but he's taking them um, to mask that pain that he has there, and he's getting tendonitis too. Mm. So he's he's maybe reducing the extent of the stimulus in the way that that may have been the case with these older folks by taking the anti-inflammatories, and thus instead of like let's say he does 15 sets and he should should be doing nine. Maybe it's more like 12 sets, but it's still too much. But he's also, he's also potentially, because we tend to see slower adaptation in the tendons, um, adversely affecting the tendon rate of adaptation more so than the muscle. There yeah. may be a difference there, potentially, and that's why he's got this tendonitis that is just is perpetual. Yeah. Probably because he's doing the same movements to keep on aggravating the tendons. Right, right. Of and course. Here's the thing, like, and I know this from experience from years and years of doing this, and I've guided clients through this. Typically, you do X number of exercises. You have some that you like, and some just tend to give you the tendonitis that, that, that you tend to get, wherever it may be. Yeah. Um, but you can find other ones. So if you get on it quick right, and start doing other exercises that allow you to train the target muscle without aggravating the tendon, that ten- then you're fine. You can, you can then have several training sessions where there's no tendon aggravation. You don't have to take NSAIDs to get past it. Yeah. And you can you can sort of sort of dodge past what would have could have been become a chronic injury, but if you keep on doing those things, then you kind of get you can get to the point of no return where the only like, there's nothing left. You don't have any other alternative exercises because you've effed yourself so bad. Yeah, that there's nothing left. So that's where he may be, and that's maybe where he is in terms of taking NSAIDs because he's got he's got nothing left. So. Gosh, it's like he's beating his head against the wall. He's training in the way he's training, and he's it's too much. He's got chronic muscle soreness that's that's too high, chronic tendonitis. He's trying to treat that with with NSAIDs, and he, he's basically just shooting himself in the foot. He's beating his head against the wall um, because he's got into this chronic sort of downward spiral yeah. of excessive training and then NSAID use. If I can jump in with something, I just wanted to yeah. – revisit because i so if if 
you know, you're in a situation where you're young and healthy and have great recovery. And it, I'm, I'm, I want to revisit almost the study that you had talked about um, with with uh, the older people who were using NSAIDs and they got better benefits. You may find that if you're one of these younger, you know, somebody who's younger, great shape, great recovery, that an NSAID may block some of your gains. That may happen. But if you were somebody who had higher inflammation, it may actually bring that inflammation down into a better range. So I guess I, I just wanted to revisit that because I think that in bodybuilding, I see so much black and white. You know, one of the big ones that Dave Crossland and I always talk about is um, AIs. You know, people were yeah. so into AIs at one point and they wanted to crush estrogen. And now they want to let estrogen run as wild as possible. You know, that, that, that it's either all bad or all good. AIs, right. Yeah. yeah. Every, the, 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 this is something, too, where it's not all bad and it's not all good either. You know what I mean? I, I think yeah. that's, to me, the big take home point here is that and it's interesting, too, because you're saying you can you can even get that blocking effect from vitamin C. And vitamin C is something when you first said that, when you're like, oh, guy takes you know, there was a study. Uh, these these people were taking 500 milligrams of vitamin C before they trained and after they trained, and it blunted their gains. I think the first thing that every bodybuilder who's thinking, who's watching this, is thinking, "Oh, that's it. I got to take vitamin C out of my diet. It's bad for my gains." Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the, here's the here's the interesting, and, and there may be one study I have to go and look because we just kind of threw this question threw it at me this morning. Yeah. Um, the, the theory behind this, and I think what can possibly be done is is it's a matter of timing so in the study with older older men in this case where they gave the vitamin c and vitamin e peri workout half the dose before half after um that was intentional because they wanted to have the system loaded with the antioxidants to blunt that free radical um stimulus and it's possible that you you can get if first because you want it you need to have vitamin c and vitamin e these are vitamins <laughs> Uh, they're necessary. We, we can't, humans can't produce vitamin C, so we have to get it from something we eat or a supplement. Um, you can take those things at a time away from your workout. So if you're training in the morning, let's say, you've set the stimulus in motion for from your training, and the adaptation process is off and running. Um, so what, what happens there, for instance, we look at, let's just think about it, what mTOR does, turns on protein synthesis. So you've got mTOR, it goes about uh, its actions in turning. Uh, there's a whole pathway AKT, and you turn on genes in the in the genome, and you see protein synthesis elevated, rapidly right after the exercise, actually, and it, it it's elevated, and then it kind of come back comes back down. The duration of that, you know, 24 hours, 40 hours, depending how, depending how trained you are, blah blah blah. But what's going on after you've trained isn't is is happens because you've triggered that with the free radicals. And the inflammatory response. So you've got other things that aren't dependent upon the initial. It's sort of like a, a, a row of dominoes. Okay. So if you take antioxidants, you're preventing that first step, which is the free radical stress in the case of, of vitamin C and vitamin E, so that you don't get the, the row of dominoes falling in the direction you want, which is towards protein synthesis and the other things that may be turned on. Yeah. But you can still take, it's not like you should just eliminate vitamin C from your, from your dietary regimen, which would be really silly unless you want scurvy. Um, you train without a mega dose of vitamin C and vitamin E in your system, not that you should take a mega dose necessarily. Then the lorodomidose is, is underway. And if you, if you take vitamin C at the end of the day, you've already got the dominoes are off and running. Yeah. The horses are off to the race. You just don't want to block them from getting out of the gate, which is what having the vitamin C and vitamin E in this case around a workout does. So let the horses get going, train without any anti-inflammatories. And in this case, this is probably exactly the opposite of what most people are going to do. They take the anti-inflammatories right before they train. Right. So they don't have pain. <laughs> so they're, they're blunting that, uh, uh, that inflammatory response right off the gate so the horses can they or maybe they kind of peter out of the gate you know you get some inflammation still you're not completely blocking it yeah um and the other way to look at this is for instance in that study with the older folks so 
what what may have been happening there's again this is just sort of my speculation um is for them and, and part of the problem with older folks is that they have a greater propensity for muscle soreness and muscle damage mm. so they're more susceptible for that some of it's probably aging mm -hmm. some of it's probably just the fact that older folks who haven't trained um or, or sedentary or untrained well they've got 30 or 40 years of being untrained as opposed to you know a twenty year old who's not trained, well he was probably he may have put, he or she may have played a lot when they were a kid. Yeah. So you've got the period of long just the aging effect, and then having been untrained for so long, so they're more susceptible to muscle damage. So it might make sense, you know, reduce that muscle damage, re reduce that the stimulus, the inflammatory response, and it brings them back down to, to a more optimal place of recovery. But if you're a younger person, and even if you're an older person. If you're doing so much that you're that sore and you have to take NSAIDs, basically it's like you're, you've pressed, you want to go 60 miles an hour because that's the right dose of training for you. And you've got, you're pressing on the accelerator with your training. So it should be going 80 because you're training too much. And then you're putting on the brake at the same time and slowing yourself back down, putting on the brake using anti inflammatories or mega dosing um, antioxidants. So you go 60. Yeah. So you know what that looks like? You're driving down the highway and you got smoke, you know, coming out <laughs> brake pads. It's a nightmare. It's like, no, ease off the accelerator. Don't train so much. Take your foot off the brake so you don't get yourself overly sore and create these tendon issues along the way. Yeah. And so find a more optimal training dose. And then the question that, that Nevin had, you know, the second part of that was like, which one should I take to minimize my, um, my potential um, secondary side effects. Yeah. So liver stress can be one of those things and, and stomach, the stomach lining can be really irritated, especially by aspirin. And that's hard to say. It's so variable. Um, I, I always tell the story about my, my grandmother who had rheumatoid arthritis and she just bucked up and, and went through it, but it was really painful. Like her, you could see her fingers were just like, they were mm -hmm. like out of a textbook. Yeah. Um, but she, she hung in there, and, and the story that my mom told me is she went into her doctor once, and like they, that this was you know decades ago. They really didn't have anything to give her at that time. So um, she's the doctor said, how are you doing? What's going on? She's like, yeah, well, I'm just taking a lot of aspirin. He's like, how many aspirin do you take? She's like, oh, about 100 a bottle a week. Oh, God. He's 100 a week? Oh, yeah. God. And, and he's like, he's like, she's like, why are you doing that? And, she, and my grandma's response was, well, what are you doing for me? Because they didn't have anyone to treat it. <laughs> She used to say those sorts of things, but her, she was fine. She did that for decades and had no stomach issues, nothing. She was, she was okay with it. Um, there's a, a, a buddy of mine I went to grad school with. He had had whiplash. So this yeah. is just sort of anecdotal stuff. And so he had chronic headaches. You never knew talking to him. It came out. I'd known him for like a year or two before this actually kind of came out. Maybe we were even talking about NSAIDs and he would take NSAIDs and what he found um, because their mechanisms of actions are a little bit different. He found that he had to rotate like every two days was sort of the sweet spot for him. So he would take ibuprofen for two days. Then he'd take naproxen for two days. I think acetaminophen worked for him as well. So he had to sort of rotate through those because they would stop working after a little while. Yeah. I've, I've experienced so, that too. I used a lot of NSAIDs when I did manual mm. labor, like more than I, I should have really, but it was really just, to, it was yeah. more than I would have liked. Let, let's put it that way. But I would end up right. like, you know, getting overtrained and then on top of it, lifting a bunch of heavy stuff, or then I'd end mm -hmm. up hurting my back at work or at the gym. And then I'd have to still use it, you know, to lift heavy stuff at work constantly. Um, right. I was going to throw one thing in as, um, I don't know if I'd call it a suggestion. I think we have it here in the U S now, as well. I know it is at least available by prescription, but I believe it's over the counter. I had to look it up to remember the name, but this stuff, Voltaren, it mm -hmm. is, they, they make it in an oral, but they also have it as a topical um, and that you can get. I don't know if it goes systemic. You'd have to look into that. I'm sure there is some sort of a systemic effect, but you can get a, um, a localized pain relief. I found it doesn't work really good for things that are like like deep, like SI issues like I had, but it works good for surface things. You know, it's made for, I believe it was initially approved for knees and hand uh, arthritis, but mm. um, it's it, it works good for like tendonitis in your elbow too. 
would you want to keep using that so that you can keep doing the thing you were doing that hurt it to begin with? Probably not. But I mean, it would be potentially as far as side effects go. It possibly could be lower side effect. I don't I don't know, though. What is what's in Volterin? What's the drug? It's a drug itself. Um, mm-hmm. oh, I can, yeah. I can kinda... yeah, I can look it up here. Let me see here. Um, is it paracetam? Let's see. Volterin is diclofenac. It's diclofenac. Okay. Okay. Do you know that drug? Yeah, and that's one that's it's it's funny. That's one that's used in a lot of the animal studies. With, is it um, really? Yeah. <laughs> There's actually. I think it was diclofenac. I can look it up real quick. Uh, there was one study because we did some uh, NSAID work when I was in grad school where they gave rats um, that they had a control group and they had a treatment group. The rats got, I think, diclofenac. It was a, an NSAID and they they ran them through the ringer and did a, um, a muscle soreness protocol. I think they I think they may have electrically stimulated the plantar flexors and just forced the, the calf to go back and forth. So they just kind of destroyed the calf. Yeah. And then they 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 followed up with the animals and they they subsequently um in cohorts, uh, examine how the muscle's recovering. Hmm. And what happened, the, the issue was that after like I don't know, 80 days or 90 days, the NSA group never fully recovered. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And there's actually, there's actually a study, I believe with N-acetylcysteine where they have a same, there's a similar type of effect. It was like nine days afterwards, the group that was given the N-acetylcysteine didn't have complete performance recovery. Hmm. So, so here's the thing, like part, part of muscle damage um, that you create with when you train is simply mechanical disruption of the contractile elements. Okay. That's, that's the initial injury. So um, and I could, like, sometimes they use crush injuries to look at like anti-inflammatories. They literally just crush the muscle like it's like been in a car wreck and you, you know, your muscle mm. got slammed against the frame of the car or who knows what. But you literally have major disruption of the actin and myosin they just all it's all fucked up it's like if you had a a, a, a jar or a canister of, of hard spaghetti and uncooked spaghetti or pick them up sticks you know and you drop it on the floor and they go everywhere yeah. it's just this total misalignment um so then the inflammatory process is to go in there and clean those things out there's some autophagy that's involved there you're cleaning out um and reusing protein amino acids to some degree to rebuild and then if you're if you're progressively overloading with resistance training the idea is that you come back stronger. But yeah. if you have an extreme injury or maybe you're extraordinarily sore and not recovering um, and you're taking anti-inflammatories, this is what the single study with N- N-acetylcysteine showed. I think it was NAC. I'm pretty sure um, they didn't have, re- they didn't fully recover. The performance never came back like nine days later. And that's because they blunted that cleanup and recovery process because mm-hmm. they blunted the inflammatory process. So the inflammation is normal. It's, it's what you want. Um, this is just a general, this is a whole other topic, but a general thought, um, and you can, people can Google this, you know, the idea of rest, pressure, rest, ice, recovery, elevation, you know, mm-hmm. using ice when you've injured yourself. I haven't been able to find anything. And I've read some articles where it's very, you can't really find some of the original studies that suggest that ice is, is helpful in this regard. Really? Yeah. Huh. And when you use ice, there's actually you're doing the same thing. You're preventing that inflammatory response. You're preventing um, the immune cells that that infiltrate that area and are part of conducting that inflammatory response from making their way in because you're not allowing the blood flow because you've got vasoconstriction. Huh. You're basically numbing. You're numbing the area. That's part of the pain relief. And then you're preventing the inflammation. That doesn't that doesn't help. Um, they can do compression is another way that this has sort of been examined with muscle soreness. You, you can reduce muscle soreness by they put a compression sleeve. Let's say you do a bunch of biceps work and they put a compression sleeve on the body. Well, you'll have less muscle soreness because you have less less inflammation. Yeah. But but that's not what you want to do. The the it's it's this this typical I'll call it just hubris of the of of humans to think eh we know better than Mother Nature. <laughs> you know, we'll just take our drugs and we'll just we'll just throw a drug in there and we can make things better. Yeah. Um, and and we're really kind of we're 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 dancing on eggshells to a certain degree when we're doing bodybuilding because we're like always call it's it's a, it's an unnatural act. You've heard me say that a million times. Yeah. And we're hacking in to our biological processes to produce this muscular callus. Um, and that's just one of a multitude of potential adaptive mechanisms that are available to us. So we're trying to get the muscle to grow. 
um, by doing whatever training regime, you know, we have to do. And we're, so we're, we're injuring it and, and trying to make it's, it's sort of like, I mean, like, this is kind of a nasty example. Like, so you got a dog that you want to make into a fighting dog. So you just keep on beating it down until it gets angry and mean. It's sort of what you do to your muscle. You'd really punish it. Um, and train it because you, you pick something up and then you lower it down again, which is just crazy. You pick it up again and lower it down again. You injure it in a certain sense so that it will have no choice but to adapt and get bigger. Hmm. Um, but it's, but that's a delicate process. You do too much of it and then try to use drugs to cover up, um, the signals that your body's telling you that, Hey, leave this thing alone, let it adapt, let it recover. And, then you're like, eventually, Mother Nature's gonna say, "Yeah, no, nah, you're sorry. I'm gonna let you tear this muscle. That's that's your next your next mm-hmm. lesson. Um, if you want to play around with an uh, inflamed tendon and train this way for weeks or months on end." Okay. So, are you saying then that we should never use NSAIDs? No, I think I think there are definitely uses for them, of course. <laughs> but but chronically to mask pain and to be able to because you're, you're like I said, you're defeating your own purpose by by using them chronically in this way to just keep on going in the gym yeah. like the whole idea is to say okay i want to cultivate a muscular growth adaptation here and it's and it's a tricky tricky thing because there's multiple ways the body can grow or both ways the body can adapt to resistance training nervous system can get much better at the lift you can have all sorts of enzymatic adaptations you can have changes in the myosin isoforms that give you a better more economic or efficient muscle contraction we're just trying to like focus on one thing. I don't care what muscle types in there. I don't care what enzymes in there. I just want the muscle bigger. Yeah. I want a big, calloused, oversized muscle, right? That probably is is not even really functional um, <laughs> or other things. Like imagine, like imagine if you took like I'm just gonna pick out Nick Walker, someone who's just got incredible. I say, okay, Nick, like go do a ten mile run. Yeah. Ain't happening. He's no not way. made for that. It's not what he's made yeah. for. Yeah. No, he, he he's not. He's like it, but. But he, but if you look, there, I think someone posted up like a progression from him from early on, and if you look at some of his first pictures and he, when he first stepped on stage, I mean he he wasn't just like this guy's never going to have any potential. But I could see D- Dave Palumbo is even better example. Let's go to Dave. Okay, you've seen the picture of Dave when he was an endurance runner, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what Dave did in college. He ran. He, I think he ran endurance events. He and did. look at him now. Yeah, you know he's a very thin guy. He has decent genetics for that. That's what humans like. We're meant to sort of migrate and, and walk and, and hunt over long paths, long long stretches. And some of us have just the the right genetics to adapt in the way we do to resistance training. But but it's not certainly not everybody. Yeah. So you got to be nice to the muscle because you're asking it to do something that's really kind of extraordinary. If you keep on beating it, you know it's gonna it's gonna bite back. Um, I knew you'd have some so. good stuff on this one. Yeah. It's and it's interesting. and it's stuff we had talked about before, but like I said, we hadn't made a, a topic out of it. I'll I'll grab the the yeah. Let me throw one more thought in there because yeah. um something that I did we didn't get into this we don't have to but there's there's cox there's different the way NSAIDs work generally is they inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme which is sort of the rate limiting enzyme for turning on this inflammatory process and there's different isoforms cox one cox two and you know, if you dig into the literature, you'll or just kind of do a quick Google search, you'll see acetaminophen is an antipyretic, so it reduces fever and it's a pain reliever, but it's not an anti-inflammatory. Um, so people say, well, that one's the one you want to use. Maybe I've seen it noted that there may be a Cox isoform in the brain, so it inhibits inflammatory huh. responses in the brain, and that's why it relieves pain there, potentially for like headaches. Yeah. Right. Um, but I also found another paper, just like in the few minutes I was just digging around, it, there's, they hypothesized there's a COX-3 isoform somewhere. Hmm. And aside from all of that, in this study that I mentioned with the older folks, they gave acetaminophen, Tylenol, which is thought, this is why they tested the, both of these, and they gave ibuprofen. So ibuprofen, is, it's acknowledged as an NSAID, but acetaminophen is kind of like, eh, is it an NSAID, is it not, it's just a pain reliever. And basically acetaminophen and ibuprofen had the same impact on these older guys, older trainees, and that they got better growth. Hmm. So those two both worked in the same way. There may they, I, So I wouldn't, if someone say, well, I'll just use acetaminophen because it's not an NSAID, it's just a painkiller. And that way I can avoid this blunting of the muscle growth adaptation. This study with, um, out, of, out of Ball State in Indiana, 
suggests that acetaminophen is kind of acting the same way that ibuprofen is. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on that necessarily. Huh. Um, I'll be damned. Which, and that, yeah. So it's really interesting. We don't really understand what's going on there. The Cox isoforms are different in rats versus humans. It's, it's a pretty complicated, but very interesting story. Huh.